wanted to get updates and wanted to know what's happening with you and your business and the uh, concealed carry and training and, and just getting all the good news from you because <laughs> I've seen you doing a lot of things. So, um, so yeah, we, we, we can go from there. So what have you been up to the past uh, year so far? Oh, wow. It's been a very busy year. And so lots of things going on in terms of business. So E3 Personal Defense continues to teach classes. We continue to certify instructors, continuing as well for myself and other members of our team to get training. Um, and then with Inner Peace as well, we're also undergoing a big sort of overhaul with that organization. We are looking at some sponsorships and partnerships that hopefully we'll be able to announce pretty soon that will allow us to kind of go out and reach women who normally would not have access to firearms training. So that's kind of been our, you know, our motivation from the beginning is to make sure that everyone is at least aware of their Second Amendment rights and has the ability to exercise them if they so choose. So lots going on um, in yeah. the background, lots of traveling and training, and I'm grateful. It's been a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm glad you're spreading the word about this, especially so are, are you reaching more of the um, communities that wouldn't normally be uh, or have access to firearms or be aware of their Second Amendment rights? Is that a target that you're hitting? Absolutely. That that has been our target since the beginning, but I think we've become more equipped to actually reach those populations over the last couple of years. So specifically, we are looking for women, uh, women of color, especially. Also looking at socioeconomic factors. Unfortunately, you know, it's very expensive to exercise your Second Amendment rights, which is the reason yeah. that so many people of color who get into gun trouble, right? The, the ones who live in the neighborhoods where they need the self-defense, they can't afford the concealed carry classes and the licenses and the training. Right. And then on top of that, the firearm. So we're, we're working, you know, with all types of organizations, including political ones, to try to bring some awareness to that. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we don't have to have money to exercise our right to vote. You don't have right. to have money to exercise your right to free speech. But for whatever reason, you almost need at least a thousand dollars, twelve hundred out of pocket just to get a firearm. <laughs> and if some of these other laws pass, you need another thousand to fifteen hundred to get a safe that the federal government deems appropriate. Right. So right, these are all right. barriers and factors that are going to affect people who look a certain way and people mm -hmm. who make a certain amount of money or or not. And, and that's just a fact. So we need to consider that um, and think about that when it comes to passing some of these laws. Yeah, I mean, the uphill battles and the barriers that are put in front of us just to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, when, when, I, when I first got into firearms, of course, I got into the military. So I'm a Jersey boy, right, mm -hmm. by nature. And of course, the laws in Jersey are very strict. Uh, there's a lot of uh, loopholes you have to go through just to get your concealed carry. Mm hmm. And if you don't know a police officer or someone in government, you're, you're going to get denied. Um, right. So th those were some of the barriers. And then when I went into the military, you know, I, it kind of opened up my eyes. OK, this is a personal decision. Um, mm -hmm. And then it went further into, hey, if I have a family one day, I want to protect my family and myself. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the importance that you're spreading and giving to especially women. Uh, I just got my wife her uh, renewal for her concealed carry because we moved. So, uh, mm -hmm. but just getting them into it, and, and I, th I think it is a a cultural shock when it comes to having a firearm. It's quote unquote scary sometimes. It's the unknown. Um, so, how do you, I guess, even the playing field and and gently guide people through the process of owning a firearm when they haven't owned one before? First, I recognize a firearm is not necessarily for everybody, and that's okay. It needs to be a personal choice, uh, but it's my job to make sure that those I come in contact with have all of the facts, all the information, so they can make the choice that's best for them. So that, that's the first thing. But I would say in addition to that, I don't focus on the gun. The gun is just a tool. What we do is we build confidence in people 
who have been taught either by culture, by a broken family, by religion, by whatever, that they're not good enough. At the end of the day, that's how we are reaching these people. These, these people that we come in contact with for whatever reason, they will they'll buy they'll fight anybody over their children. They'll fight anybody for their mom, their dad, right. their husbands, whatever. <laughs> But when it comes to taking care of themselves in general, whether that be their health, their physical health or mental health, their personal defense, it's an afterthought. And so what I've personally found is teaching people their worth is what starts the whole process, if you will. Once they understand I'm worth defending, the gun is just mm -hmm. one tool in that whole defensive mindset. And so that's yeah. where they can say, you know what? I'm worth this too. You know, if somebody comes into my house, it's my life is worth being defended. And if I shoot mm -hmm. that person, they're the ones that brought me into this situation. I'm not going out hunting people. You know, it's a different mindset that they have to understand and they have to accept. And so that's the approach that we take. It's been a successful one. Um, and we've been able to just kind of see people light up, you know, and, and recognizing yeah. The confidence um, that is so broken in so many of us. And, and that's really what it's about for me. Yeah. Self-worth. I, I, that, that's an important part because mm -hmm. the firearm is just, just a tool for us. Exactly. You have to have self-worth. You have to have confidence. Mm -hmm. You have to believe in yourself. So the whole empowering part is a big factor in this. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you find it, do you find it easier or harder to, once you have that individual uh, and their mind is set that they want to own a firearm. Is it easier for them to bring in their family into that kind of environment or is it harder? I think it depends on the circumstances. Um, I, I do find a lot of the ladies will get very excited about, you know, introducing their children, which I found to be a surprise, but once they understand yeah. the safety, they're, they're usually gung ho about introducing their children. I have mm. seen some resistance in introducing the husbands and the boyfriends because they kind of want something to themselves. <laughs> right, right. It's absolutely okay. I think that's the other piece is that these ladies, especially some of the men too, but especially the ladies, they're learning to enjoy firearms. And, and there's mm. a whole world out there besides self-defense that has also been not visible to people of color in particular. You know, you've got your competition shooting, you've got plinking, mm -hmm. I talk to young kids all the time. Most of these colleges and universities have some sort of gun club and shooting team. They get yeah. scholarships just like the football players, the soccer players, the basketball players. But these are things that have never even crossed our minds because of cultural barriers, you know. And so right. having all of that access, it, it's like a new world opening up to many people. Yeah. I mean, the the, the cultural barriers definitely plays a big part and just knowing what's out there and what's available. And I think you bring up a good point when knowing what institutions are doing what and how normal it is to those institutions, mm -hmm. but it's a taboo in other communities, yeah. you know, because of, you know, the, the bad reputation that firearms get in general. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just competition shooting or just shooting clubs uh, yeah. ed education on, on shooting and, and schools having these type of classes. Mm -hmm. Again, it, it's, it's out there. We just have to know the information. Now you brought up politics, yes. right? <laughs> and I, I, I am curious to know your thoughts on how you see politics intertwine with our second amendment rights and awesome. the difference between or if there is a difference between the two parties and how they feel about our rights. So I'm going to start out by saying I hate politics. I, I don't consider myself to be a political person. I try to be very sober about the Second Amendment. I mean, it's, it's not a secret, right? When, when the Second Amendment was written, people that look like you and I were not in mind. It, it right. is what it is, right? Um, and now when I look at politics, to me, it is all sort of a game, whether you're red or whether you're blue, you're going to hear promises that are not met. I'm not going to put mm -hmm. my confidence in that. What I wish people would pay more attention to, as opposed to the president of the United States, the vice president, while they are important, your local government, that's where the mm -hmm. change when these people, when your representatives are writing up these bills and they're voting on them in private and in sessions that the, that the general public is not privy to or not going to attend, that's where the change happens. 
You know, here in North Carolina, we just got rid of a Jim Crow law that required a permit in order to purchase firearms. That's an old Jim Crow law that's been on the books forever. But as the conversation was happening in North Carolina at the local level, so many people were ignorant to that, right? So we're worried Mm -hmm. about all of this nationwide reciprocity and so forth. And I'm not saying those things are not important, but when it comes when it comes to really what your rights look like and your ability to exercise those rights, we need Mm -hmm. to pay attention to our local governments and we need to have our voices represented and heard there. And we will find that regardless of whether that person is red or blue, when they're having those conversations, those lines get really fuzzy. You know, at, at this point when we're having political discussions, everybody's playing to their constituents, right? They're going to say whatever needs to be said to be elected. It is, I hate to to minimize it to this, but it's a popularity contest. I'm I'm Mm -hmm. not swayed by that. And we can't be so ignorant as to think that the president, the vice president can do anything without all these other folks. We need to worry about our Supreme Court. I mean, these people are in Mm -hmm. office until they die. So there are still people who are sitting on Supreme Court benches who would have favored lynching our grandparents. That should bother us, right? So it's a it's a it's a game. And I just wish that we would be more educated and a little bit less emotional when it comes to that. I'm not me personally, you know, and it's it's everyone's right to vote the way you want, just vote. I will say I am not um I, I'm not associated with either party. I don't trust either one. <laughs> But I, I, every election, I choose the lesser of two evils, so to speak. And that's right. kind of how I approach it. And I just listen to whatever the issues are that are on the table. Yeah, I I, I like that you focus on the local politics because that that's what really changes communities. That's yeah. what is going to affect you directly. Government, major government politics. Yes, it's good, but it's a it's a circus at the mm-hmm. end of the day. So I th- think the the more uh, focus we put on local politics, who is on our boards, who are on mm-hmm. our school boards, you know, yes. who who are the directors, who who are working the, the utility companies around us, mm-hmm. uh, who, who are working on our streets and our roads and our signage, and and that all is local, and I yeah. think people need to kind of wake up, smell the coffee, and focus on that it's funny because we were having this conversation the other day about local politics because everybody Mm -hmm. and their mom's talking about who's going to be the next president that's all fine and dandy but what's really going to affect us um i mean we see now with these local storms these hurricanes you know it's local government that is responding first local government that's putting evacuation orders in place local government who's telling the National Guard, the sheriffs, first responders, what to do and how to do it. Right. Absolutely. So yeah. like you said, I, 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 I'm i right there with you. Local government is most important out of anything when it comes to politics in, in our communities. Um, sp- speaking of which, you're you're in uh, North Carolina and yes. are, are you, you based in Raleigh? I am. Yes. Mm-hmm. OK. Now, did you guys get affected by these storms or hurricanes? In your area. Did, thank God we had the rain, um, a little bit of okay. flooding, but nothing major. We, we were in the clear, which is I'm very thankful for. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Because I got some guys out in Asheville now helping with uh, disaster relief. Um, mm-hmm. I know they're they're on the west side of you far, far west. It was about like five, six hours from from Raleigh. A little bit less than that, maybe four okay. ish around there. OK. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be in. uh uh, what's that town? Robbins uh, for a preparedness expo um, cool. with a bunch of uh, preppers and, and survivalists out there. I'm, I'm going to stay in Sanford uh, down there, but I'm going to travel up to Robbins. So um, I'll be there in two weeks for that event. Um, so I'm kind of excited, kind of, you know, I'm not sure how the environment, you know, is going to be, especially with the the storms uh, around there. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Uh, but what, what's your next travel plans? Do you have anything coming up, events, things like that, that people should know about? Uh, let's see. I do have an event coming up at the end of this month. So we've partnered with the Master's Touch Ministries in Richmond, Virginia, and we are okay. doing a big 
empowerment session there. Um, so there's a spiritual component. And then, of course, there's the physical component. We'll talk about firearms and personal safety. We did this a couple months ago, and it was a big hit. So we're going back okay. to Virginia to do that at the end of the awesome. month. That, so that's really in my neck of the woods. <laughs> yeah, right I'm up there, in Virginia. So yeah. Lots of late came out. It, it was awesome. So we'll be doing that again. This time we awesome. are adding a live fire component. So we will do what we call our empowerment parties. So we talk to the ladies about situational awareness. We go over gun safety. We play on the, the big screen, the fun smokeless range. And yeah. they learn about handguns, rifles and shotguns. And then this time we will have a live range component where the ladies can meet us out at the live range and shoot all three wow. if they like. It's fun. Wow. That's pretty good. Hey, you, you, you're doing it up with, with the ladies. <laughs> that 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 that's the exciting piece right there, um, because it it is important for women to protect themselves, feel safe, uh, and feel safe with their their children, their family. Um, do, do you get any feedback from any of the spouses or the husbands while you're teaching the ladies? Is that a, a component in this, or is it just you're talking to the ladies? <laughs> Usually they're very thankful um, and we tend to throw them out a lot. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> You know, if you, if you have your husband, the boyfriend, even sometimes the son, you know, on the range, right. they're so worried about what they are saying and their feedback. So what we say to them is, listen, you know, men and women are different. It, it's, it's a mm. fact. You know, we can get into all the biology, but I like to sum it up very simply. I can't remember the scientist who came up with this theory, but he basically said a woman's brain is like spaghetti. A man's brain is like waffle. And that is so yeah. very true. We just learn differently. And so we yeah. ask the gentleman to step to the side or go sit in their car, go home, come back, whatever is needed, <laughs> <laughs> so that we can help the ladies learn in a way that is proven and true. Uh, and then yeah. oftentimes they come back and they're surprised because those ladies, nine times out of 10, shoot better even after their okay. first time learning than their significant others. Now, men have the wow. edge when it comes to speed and movement because women are so calculated, but when it comes to accuracy and bullseye shooting, ladies take it every time. <laughs> every time, right. <laughs> Without fail. <laughs> uh, no, that's good. What's your, 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 your favorite uh, brand to, 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 to use on the range of firearm? Of firearm? Yeah. Oh boy. I, I, I gotta tell you, I'm a bull armory fan. I, I know I've not. Bull arm, okay. I've heard anything by bull since the whole war and i know there's a lot going on around that but I, i'll right. tell you I, I will take a bull armory firearm <laughs> in terms of a handgun against yeah. any staccato um you know against pretty much anything so um i love yeah. them and then anything dan wesson is is right there behind it <laughs> okay all right don't let the clock guys hear you say that yeah <laughs> i like but I, I am a 1911 girl. I, you know, right. I, don't know. I just love my 1911s. <laughs> no, nah, that's good. That's good. I think, um, you know, it, it's it's amazing how far we've come, uh, mm -hmm. especially culturally in, in firearms and embracing this culture and not being afraid to speak about it, talk about it, teach about it. And yes. that's the important part for me because Again, I'm in the preparedness community. Sometimes I can be the only one at some of these events. Um, so it's definitely nice to see a woman of color uh, and you doing all this work in the community and women and empowering them uh, to move forward in, in this area. Um, I never asked. I don't think I asked you this when we last talked. Mm -hmm. How did you get into owning your first firearm? Like, was there a significant event that happens with somebody there that to guide you into, into this? That's a funny story. I, I I will say I got into firearms from a position of privilege, and I, I'm fully aware of that. When I turned 40, I wanted to learn how to shoot a gun. Um, I grew up in the country. Well, you know, I was born and raised in Raleigh, but we spent a lot of time in the country with my grandparents. And my grandfather had his shotguns and rifles for hunting and things. And, mm -hmm. you know, guns were around, but I just never had an interest in them. And so my husband right. was in the Marine Corps. I knew he was familiar with firearms. And so when I turned okay. 40, I said, hey, I just want to learn how to shoot a gun. It's a bucket list thing. My kids are older. Let's do it. So he was smart. He said, I'm not going to teach you because that's not going to work. You're not going to listen to me. I'm going to hire someone. And he went and mm -hmm. he found a great person. He he hired a local top shot winner here in the area mm -hmm. 
teach me. I went to his amazing class. Um, the first shot scared the bejesus out of me. I heard it in the <laughs> range and I was ready to go. But then he yeah. put the gun in my hand and it, there was a sense of empowerment that came over mm. me. And so that day I didn't know what I was doing, but I just looked around. And I said, ooh, I want a Glock 43. The Glock 43 had just come out. I went and I bought my little black Glock 43 and I put 5,000 rounds to that thing within 30 days. Wow. It was just passion. I would go at lunch. It was it was helping me to deal with stress. I was right. just having a good time. And so started taking classes and those bills started adding up. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> and that's where I just kind of had this aha moment because, you know, my husband and I are pastors and we, we counsel a lot of people and I'm thinking, yeah. you know, this person needs this and this person needs this and this person needs mm -hmm. this. And out of all the people I was listing, not one of them was in a financial or emotional position to go out and do it. And so that's what mm. triggered us to start E3 Personal Defense. We started partnering with churches first so that people could get concealed carries for a lesser charge and, you know, helping us to cover right. the cost. And then we started our community outreach program and so forth. So that was kind of how it all started. Um, and wow. then the selfish part was by starting a business, I could at least cover the cost of my own training. So or at least write it off. <laughs> and so, yes. you know, we're able to really help the community. Um, and to this day, we've never taken a dime from the business, which I'm very proud mm -hmm. to say we're able to put it all back into the business or into the community, um, which has, mm -hmm. I believe, been the reason that it, it's prospered. I think, you know, giving back always pays off. And so I'm really proud of wow. that. Wow, that's great. You mentioned churches, so yeah. I'm a PK. For ah. for those who are going to be listening and watching to this, that's a preacher's kid. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in in the church, uh, AME church, mm -hmm. okay. and so you know that whole environment. You want you you understand, oh, yeah. uh, and you know th there there's there's always a certain way you, you conduct yourself, certain things you talk about, certain things you don't talk about. That's and right. firearms was never a thing. Mm -hmm. Preparedness was never a thing. That's right. Um, as, as, as I got more into this world of preparedness and survival, um, I started to go, going to more churches mm -hmm. and more churches started reaching out to me and wanting me to give them in emergency preparedness classes. Yes. Um, and that that happened all after COVID. And mm -hmm. I think COVID kind of changed a lot of the perception of how the church is ran and how uh, they think about preparing their own congregations. Um, and especially when it comes to security. Mm -hmm. Right. There, there's been a number of events um, that have happened, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to uh, places of worship uh, that's in any denomination or religion. Um, so I think the the landscape has changed for mm -hmm. our world uh, for us to come in and kind of evolve uh, the church's standards. Um, what what's and being a pastor and and your husband uh, yourselves, how how does that, or did you see any changes when it comes to introducing firearms to the church? introducing safety and security to the church. What, what, what has been your, your guys' perspective on that? There were definitely changes in 2020. 2020 was a pivotal year for many reasons. You know, people were feeling insecure about their own safety, you know, and even in the church, I think there's been a shift as there are younger people who are coming in. We've got Google now, we've got AI now, yeah. and people started realizing, you know, Maybe that faith by works is there's something to that thing, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we have faith that God will protect our homes, but we still have fire extinguishers. We still lock our right. door. We still use security systems. You know, we have to understand sometimes when things happen in life, it's not God who's allowing it or letting us down. It's that there are bad people in the world. Right. And you have been given the authority, you've been given the power to deal with that and protect yourself. And the truth of the matter is, when we understand, going back to that confidence, that we are worthy to be defended, that alone is a deterrent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I go all over the place and people make little jokes, don't mess with joy. You know what? There's <laughs> something to that. 
It did. Yeah. I, the chances of me, let's be honest, having to ever defend myself with a firearm are actually very small, but they're going to yeah. stay small because I'm prepared to defend myself with a firearm. And, you know, right. if we, we need to just kind of tell the truth and have those real conversations. I had the same conversations yeah. with the church folks about their health. Stop mm. praying for God to heal your diabetes and, you know, heal your migraines. Yeah. And how about you eat some vegetables? Get rid of the mm. cooking oils. You, know? <laughs> you have been yeah. prepared. It's the same kind of thing. Faith without works is dead. Is and dead. so I think we're in a place now where people are starting to realize that. And I think mm. it's awesome. I think it's amazing because there's nothing more beautiful than a person who lives by faith actually prospering in life right that's the way it's right. supposed to be and so i you know i miss me with all these crazy prosperity <laughs> teachers and they taking all your money we, that's a whole different discussion but when a right. person understands where god has already empowered them and they take mm -hmm. and own that power they live prosperous lives and they are able to enable others to do the same and that's what's beautiful mm -hmm. about it yeah yeah I mean, we can look to so many books in the Bible where God told his servants to prepare, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We can name them, right? And, 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 oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. So so that that's where I always go to. You know, there, mm -hmm. there's always that sense of God always was up in preparedness, preparing his people, getting them ready for something their safety you know th 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 there was always a concern for his mm -hmm. people so uh yeah that that that's real good but no I, I i appreciate that that perspective and how you guys have been able to maneuver uh that area being pastors and being in the industry that you're in uh mm -hmm. it, it's tough it's not it's not easy for sure um how do you deal with travel when, when you're traveling place to place state to state the laws are different uh, yeah. for somebody who just got their firearm, uh, brand new, their hands are still a little bit shaky. Mm -hmm. How do you handle traveling? So me personally, if I can go to, if I go to any state that will remotely allow my firearm, I'm taking it. Um, so again, you know, it's for safety, but also I'm just going to be honest. I don't have to wait on baggage claim. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I fly American and Delta. And as you know, if you check your firearm, you get to go to the little concierge area. You pick up your bag. Right. You know, there are little perks, right? But in all right. seriousness, I, I encourage people, if you're going to travel, especially to a place where you are not familiar with the area, that is where you're most susceptible to violent crime. That's where you're, you're not, mm. your situational awareness might be a little bit off because you don't know exactly what to look for. So whenever mm. possible, Take your firearm with you. If you don't carry a firearm, take something that you can defend yourself with. It's important mm -hmm. to read up on the laws before you get there. It's important to understand the travel restrictions, whether you're traveling by fire by uh, uh, airplane or if you're putting your firearm in your vehicle. Read up on those things before you travel, but never go naked. Always have mm -hmm. something that you can defend yourself with. And should you even find yourself in a position where maybe you're a college student, you're you're traveling right. with your, your sports team at school, you better look around, keep that situ situational awareness sharp and look for weapons of opportunity. Ask yourself, yeah. if somebody breaks on this bus, what can I take out of my bag to cause an issue? Mm. Because at the end of the day, the bad guys don't want to fight. Most people, just by defending themselves, will save their life. Mm. Just by def just by putting up a fight, you don't even have to finish it. They don't want that that smoke. They want an easy target. Right. And so, just teaching people about situational awareness from the beginning, I think, will help yeah. in so many ways. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 gonna put in a shameless plug right now. Uh, my book, yeah, The Eye of Clarity: uh, The Keys to Effective Situational Awareness on Amazon. Shameless plug, right? Because you mentioned situational awareness. Um, and that's what this book is on. But I want to get your perspective because when I'm with my wife mm -hmm. and we go out to dinner or we go to the mall, we're walking down the street in downtown, she's on her phone, she's paying attention to one thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm paying attention to every little mouse that creaks around the corner. Um, do you 
see this dynamic uh, between the women uh, that, that you work with and try to open their eyes to situational awareness? Unfortunately, it's common with the ladies as well as the children, the teenagers, the young adults. And, and what I try to explain to them is the bad guy has two windows of opportunity. One is time and the other is space. And so if you are focused on a phone or a tablet or, you know, whatever little devices in your hands, you are giving them the benefit of time and space because they're going to catch you by surprise. And before you know it, they're on you. So you've got to eliminate that. And, and we, right. we try to get them to see that and kind of get that aha moment. And then from there, they're much more aware. You know, I mentioned my husband was a Marine. He's 6'1", right. 6'2", about 250, big guy. He picks on me because when we go out to dinner, Joy is facing the door. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I'm not going to. I'm like, I love you, but I need to see the door because I'm slower, you know, right. <laughs> I need to be there. But these ladies, I'm finding especially, and even the young people, once they understand that, we talk about the tool or drill and things of that sort to kind of give them a realistic, you know, example. Mm -hmm. uh, but once they realize that, they're like, oh, mm -hmm. I, I can actually save myself just by being aware. And we also use being Southern as an example, right? Or as, a, as an advantage. Mm -hmm. I am a Southern woman. When I go out, I speak to people, I look them in their eye and, and I've, I have two adult children. I'm old enough that I have earned the right that you will speak to me. So when I say, good morning, young man, and he doesn't say, young man, I say, good morning, you're going to speak to me. And so once a person <laughs> knows that you are a human, it also mm -hmm. makes it so much harder for there ever to be an attack or a level of disrespect. Mm -hmm. And so these mm -hmm. young people especially need to understand, look people in the eye, walk with yeah. your shoulders back and your neck erect, you know, with confidence. Right. Again, there's that word and people right. are not going to bother you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. I, especially now in this technological world where there, we have so many distractions, either our phones for the most part, computers, TV, media, social media, entertainment galore. Uh, there's so many distractions that keep us away from our situational awareness, our focus, uh, and our mentality to fight uh, yeah. when we need it the most. Um, so especially with, with, with kids, I mean, my son's only two and I'm thinking about, you know, how is he going to be in the next 10, 20 years, you know, with this world moving so fast in technology um and that that's that's one of the things you know that i'm i'm kind of focusing on and trying to figure out you know is there something is there a class that needs to be taught about this you know uh <laughs> because we're, we're just in a different day we're, we're in a different time you know it, it's not the same as it was even in the early 2000s uh you know I, I'm, I'm still a baby of dial-up so that's you know how far we've come uh with yeah. internet uh, from that being on our uh, smart devices. Um, but again, this this conversation has been great. I don't want to go too long uh, because we both got things to do. Uh, <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, this is Dr. Uh, Joy Allen. And you can get all of her information um, on E3. Uh, Was it E3 Personal Defense? Um, and your other platforms that you have, do you want to shout those out as well? Sure. So we are on Facebook and Instagram. And then our ladies organization is Inner Peace. That's I-N-H-E-R-P-I-E-C-E dot -E -E com as well. Also on Facebook and, and, and Instagram if you don't uh, want to visit the website. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I enjoyed this conversation. This is going to be uh, posted up on YouTube and on Instagram. We're going to promote all the things that you're doing uh, on, on our sites. Uh, so I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on Preparedness Talk.